Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back. This is the third and final session of a webinar on introduction to using the WIC model with NASA Remote Sensing Observations. Uh, we had our two webinars already on 15th and 22nd of February. And first, in first, Kel Margaret talked about introduction to the WIC hydrological model. He went through all the processes that are involved in the model and um, all the parameterizations that are there in the model. So general layout, he also talked about the model itself. Last week, we talked about overview of remote sensing based input data for WIC. Uh, we went through step-by-step -step demonstration of how to get forcing data uh, from different websites that NASA provides and how to pre-process some of the data. So today's session will focus on implementing input data that we downloaded uh, last week into WIC model. In addition, uh, Kel Market is going to walk us through how exactly to reformat inputs so that they are compatible with what WIC requires. Uh, he's going to demo some of the scripts that he has developed to do uh, the same. And uh, what we're going to do is, uh, Kel is going to show cases of WIC applications in Mekong Basin. And then we are also going to have a couple of slides showing uh, results for 2017 flooding in Mekong Basin. Uh, this is based on the input data we downloaded last week. So again, this is the RSET site where you can find course material. Um, I'm sure you all have looked at it now. All the slides or presentations are uh, available here. And after the session, you find recordings also. So you can go back and review the recording at your convenience. Just to uh, recap, we have a homework posted on the website as well. It, it is there today. And uh, it will be due by 16th of March. Um, and then uh, those of you who have attended all the webinars and who submit homework through a Google form link, uh, you will receive a certificate of completion in a couple of months after today. So with that, uh, we're going to start with overview of WIC implementation for a river basin. And again, the example we have considered is the Mekong River Basin. Uh, the idea here is to introduce uh, everyone what is involved in running a hydrologic model. So actually, this is just gives you a flavor of what is involved starting from downloading model, then downloading inputs, reformatting them, and then running the model and looking at the output. So this webinar focused more on just giving you information about it. And if you want to download the model and go through the same steps, uh, you can go back and look at the presentation slides as well as the recordings. And that is a guide for you. You can also contact us for more information if you like. And also, uh, we, if you are interested, we may plan a more advanced training uh, for you, which will be much longer and more involved in which you actually have some hands-on experience in working with input data and uh, downloading model and running it. So if you are interested, uh, please indicate in the chat box that you would like such a training in future. So this is just a general outline. Will Kel Margaret will go through quick uh, input data formatting, with simulation and output analysis. He will also touch on how to calibrate the model, and then we will conclude with examples of where WIC is already used for applications, and then we will summarize today's um, webinar as well as this webinar series. Thank you. So Kel, with that, uh, please take over. Thank you, Amita, and hi, everyone. So now I'm going to walk you through how we take the NASA Earth observations uh, data sets that we downloaded last session and how we can format them and put them into the VIC model and run the VIC model. So um, 
we're going to walk through a specific application we have for the Mekong Basin. Um, so what Amita and I did is we downloaded uh, the same data sets we walked through last week, uh, like iMERGE and MERA and MODIS land cover. Uh, we set up the model for a 0 .01 degree, sorry, 0 0.1 degree resolution um, grid cell. Of course, we used all 16 land cover classes and specified um, 100 meter elevation bands. Um, and so for, um, for this VIC model, um, we used iMERGE precipitation and MERA reanalysis meteorological forcing data sets. And so we plan to use this for some flooding and stream flow monitoring, drought monitoring, or basin management applications. And we're going to show a specific um, highlight from last year's flooding in northeast Thailand. And Mina will walk through that later on. So before we start uh, going through the setup of the VIC model, I want to note that the data was uh, pre-processed beforehand. And I'm not going to show that because that takes a little bit of time and we want to make sure that we're getting through the session in our allotted time. So the data was clipped to the Mekong Basin. What I mean by clipped is we you know, added the data set to QJS or ArcGIS and we used um, some extraction tools to make sure that the data was only for the Mekong Basin. Uh, we made sure that all the pixels aligned spatially. And what I mean by that is that for each grid cell, all the pixels um, overlay each other perfectly. And then also some additional data set was derived, such as slope from elevation data set and average annual precipitation from high merge data sets. Also too, so the model has some uh, lookup parameter parameterizations. And so um, when, we go into the, when we're going through the scripts, um, I won't show that, but just understand that on the back end, uh, we're deriving some additional uh, parameterizations from these GIS data sets. Okay, so uh, here I wanted to highlight um, that we're using this package or this code um, that's available freely on GitHub um, to do this process. So when I'm walking through these processes and showing scripts, um, they're all from this package and you can download it uh, using the link to the left there. Okay, so we're going to dive into a video. It will be about 25 minutes long. Um, I will go a bit quickly just to make sure that we're uh, staying in with time. Um, and by the end, we're going to have a VIC model run and look at outputs. Okay, so here I've downloaded that package that I just showed on the previous slide. And now I have my scripts and everything. Right now, what I'm going to do is show you guys how to install the VIC model. So let's go ahead and start. So here, I'm just showing you the web address of where to download the source code of the VIC model. So you go here to GitHub forward slash EW Hydro forward slash VIC, and this has all the source code. And you can also go and open the docs, and you can see documentation information. So this, too, has multiple versions of the model. So I use the VIC 4.2.D, um, and it also has all that information as well down there. Um, to download the data, you just click on the green button on the right and download the zip file. So I've already downloaded this, and so I'm going to show you what I have from the downloaded. So you see here I have my VIC zip file and the folder. So I'm going to change directories into the folder. And when I list everything, it has a bunch of like documentation and samples and the source code and some tools. So I'm going to move into the source code directory. And if we look at all the files in here, they're all C files. And there's one particular file that we're interested in, that's a make file. So to make the model, we're just going to type make, M-A-K-E, hit enter, and then everything should start compiling. At the end, we should exit out with no errors. It's nice. And then if we list everything again on the, in the folder, then we see that we now have these object files. And if we scroll up, we now see that we have the VIC executable file. So that's how you compile the model. We can check that the model compiled correctly by typing in the command vicnl-h will give us 
uh, help information, and now we can see that it's compiled, and we can uh, pass information into the model. Okay, so next we're going to show you how to set up the model. So right now I'm starting off. I have my global parameter file that's in, in the um, example folder that the Vic model has. And so I'm just going to change my directories into where I have my model set up, my scripts, and my data. So here I'm just changing directories into there. So I do this all in the terminal via command line on Linux. And so the CD command is change directory. Now I'm just passing in the path to that directory. Okay, so now I'm in my scripts folder that I downloaded from my GitHub repository. So now I'm just typing in a command using Python. So my ogpy is an alias for my, Py my Python 2.7 command. And so now I have this script format snow params dot pi, and this script formats GIS data into our snow parameter file data. So I pass in my Macon grid file, which is the grid that I want to create the, um, the model for. I'm passing in some elevation information and my output snow parameter file path and the elevation uh, interval that I want to create the snow parameter file for. So I hit enter, and now it's crunching all the data. Give it a few seconds here. It's taking quite a while because it's a large basin and the interval is pretty high. Okay, so now it exited out. And so we saw that we have 21 bands. So that will be important later on. So here I open up my snow band file, and I can see my information on the left is the grid cell, and then it calculates the fractional cover of each elevation band and the mean height for each elevation band in the format that Vic needs it. So there's a bunch of lines of code. Um, that script just handles that all for you. Okay, so now that I've created that, next I'm going to create my uh, soil parameter file. So there's a nice script there called format underscore snow params. And here I'm passing in a lot of information. So I have to pass in my grid file, which is the grids that I'm trying to create the model for. I have to pass in elevation data. Or sorry, so uh, soil majority data. So this are these are the soil classes from the Harmonized World Soil Database. Next I'm passing in my elevation data and then annual precipitation for our initial soil moisture conditions to parameterize the initial soil moisture conditions. And lastly, the slope information for each grid cell. So these are all in GeoTIFF format. And so what the script is doing, much like the format snow params, it's taking GeoTIFF information and then converting it into a format that the VIC model can read. So lastly, I need to uh, define my output path. So I'm writing the file to the snow.param file. And I hit enter and it crunches the data, and now we have a soil param file. So if we open that up, now we see that there's a bunch of information. We have our grid cell information, our latitude longitude information, and our parameterizations for the soil files. And so this is 
all this information is either used from lookup tables, which are included in, to, in that Git repository that I showed earlier, and then also some initial parameterization and guessing. So next, um, we need to create our vegetation uh, parameter file. And so here, again, I have a script for that. So here we're in putting in our grid file again. So if you notice, we always enter in this grid file, and then that's to make sure that all the um, cells align spatially. Next, I'm putting in my land cover classification file. Here I use that MODIS um, IGBP file. Now I am outputting my vegetation parameter file and then specifying that land cover classification. All right, so that ran pretty quickly. So now I have my vegetation parameter file and I have my grid cell uh, with information on number of land cover classes, the land cover class uh, name or code, percent area coverage, and also rooting depth information for each grid cell. Again, the VIC model takes the specific uh, setups or the specific uh, formats for files. So all we're doing here is just taking GIS data and converting it into that. Next, I am creating my vegetation library file, which is a lookup table for all the for more vegetation parameterizations. And so here I am inputting in my land cover data. And so I'm grabbing this parameterization for each land cover data. I have to specify my monthly LAI, so I have uh, 12 bands of LAI data. And same with albedo, so I'm putting in that entire folder. And now I am specifying the output file and the land cover classifications. That way I can keep all the land cover classes the same that are in my vegetation parameter. Okay, runs pretty quickly. And so now we see in my folder, I have my vegetation library, which has my class number, uh, parameterizations, LAI information. Um, and if we scroll over, it has, yeah, so there are my land cover classes. If we scroll over, it has all the um, additional information and also some comments. So what are the land cover classes? Okay, so now I've created uh, my parameter, parameter files. Now I need to go and create my meteorological forcing files. So this is a somewhat specialized script. Um, you may have to update this for your own uh, needs. So what we're doing here is we're, again, specifying that grid that we're uh, creating the files for. And then I am specifying a file path that contains my meteorological data in that CDF. And so this is where um, you need to update the file to actually read in and uh, extract out that uh, meteorological information that you need. So just passing in my file uh, path to my forcing data, my raw forcing data, and then specifying my output path to the um, forcing files that we want, and then also passing a time period. So here the data is from 1980 to 2010. So I hit enter. It actually takes a really long time to run, uh, maybe on the order of a couple hours to days, depending on your time series. But here we see that for that grid cell, we have our precipitation, uh, maximum, minimum temperature, and wind speed. And so it creates a time series. So each line is a time step, and then we'll create multiple files for each grid cell. Okay. So whenever, so I'm gonna skip forward. That's gonna take some time to run, so I'm gonna skip forward. And next we're going to move on to actually running the model. So we're gonna open up the global parameters file. And here's where we specify our start year, end year, and some additional information. So I'm gonna change this start year and end year to make sure we're doing a quick model run. But you can specify all these different parameters. It has a lot. Typically, you might want to leave those as true, at least initially, and then you can specify those later on or tweak those later on. Here, I um, input in the um, file path to my forcing files, um, and then also my file path to my parameters. So these are the land surface files and parameter section. So for soil pot file, 
And this is all relative to the VIC model executable. So I put my VIC model executable in a folder just above examples or example. And so here I am changing my file path to read in that files and then some parameterizations. And so remember here my snow bands, I had 21 snow bands in the file. So here I specify the number of snow bands as well. And also how the VIC model reads specific things like where the vegetation, LAI, and albedo are coming from. And so I put those in the vegetation library file, and so I set that. Lastly, we're setting our output path to our flux file. So these are the outputs of the VIC model. And then we can also specify which outputs we want here. I'm using precipitation, evapotranspiration, runoff, base flow, snow water equivalent, soil moisture. And for example, I'm adding in a last variable surface temperature. So once that's done, I hit save. And now I go to my terminal and I'm going to run the model. So I do that dot forward slash vic, capital N, lowercase l, dash g, and the path to my global parameter file. So the global parameter file controls all, all the paths to the other parameter files in the VIC model, and we hit enter, and we see now that the model's running. So again, this may take a little bit of time, um, depending on the length of the um, model simulation and also number of cells that you're running. But we could see here in my outputs that it's starting to populate these fluxes. So this is a time series for each um, for each grid cell. So I fast forwarded, my model's done now, so I'm gonna open up this file. So the outputs are actually a time series again, so it has a um, year, month, date, and then all the parameters that I output, which is the precipitation, evapotranspiration, and so on. So this doesn't bode well for usability, so now we're going to actually uh, change how we're formatting the output fluxes. We're going to convert this into a NetCDF. And I have a script called flux and NetCDF. And so we enter in the output file where the fluxes are, output flux files are. And then we specify output file or output folder for the NetCDF data. And then we hit enter and it'll prompt us. So now we select what uh, variable we want, so I'm going to choose evapotranspiration, enter the start year, which was 2008, end year 2010, and I hit enter, and it will uh, read in all of the time series information in the fluxes files, and then um, extract out the evapotranspiration, and again, this is a net CDF, so we have to have a little bit of special software to read it in, so I'm going to show you guys um, you know, using Panoply, the outputs of the uh, VIC model. So just need to open up a new terminal here and change my directory to where I have uh, Panoply. Um, oops, forgot a little bit where it was, so here I'm just trying to find it again. So I need to go into Panoply J and Wrong file again. Okay, so it's panoply.sh, and so now I'm running panoply, and okay, now I'm changing my directory to read in the output evapotranspiration net CDF data. So I just change my directory there. Good example, my net CDF, and then evap 2008. So I could create a simple plot, which are my Latin lawns, and there we go. So we can see that's where the Mekong Basin is. So I'm going to zoom in there uh, to explore the data a little bit. Um, it looks like we have some negative evapotranspiration. Uh, you can get negative evapotranspiration using the penman monteith equation. So we're just going to force that to be zero. Um, and so... Now let's look at some of the time series. So just stepping through. So this is total evaporation at each time step in millimeters per day. And we can see now that we have outputs from the VIC model. Okay. So now that we have outputs from the VIC model, now let's use them. 
So I'm going to just clear this out and, and that. Now we want to get Streamflow. So I went ahead and fast forwarded and created our runoff and base flow net CDF data. And now we have a, a route vic.py program which takes inputs and creates and turns the runoff into or the runoff and base flow into Streamflow. And so here I'm inputting in a unit hydrograph file and I'll talk about that in a little bit, um, what that is. And I'm specifying my fraction of each grid cell. So I have a geotiff that's specifying fraction of each grid cell that contributes to that outlet. And I have a specific station in the Mekong that I'm running this for. And now I pass in my runoff and base flow data. So there's the path to the runoff file. And now I'm specifying the path to the base flow file. And now I'm specifying my output file. So it outputs a CSV, comma separated, um, comma separated file. And so I'm specifying my start year and my end year. So I actually ran the simulations again and did it from 1980 to 2010. So now I'm running this uh, model or uh, routing stream flow for 1980 to 1990. And I'm outputting daily data. Oops, I messed up the time there. I uh, just need to change this to 1231. Okay, so I'm gonna fast forward because this takes a couple minutes to run. Uh, next, well, I want to show you the unit hydrograph file. So that's an important component of the routing model. Uh, unit hydrograph is a normalized stream flow, and so Vic takes in monthly normalized stream flow as the unit hydrograph. So we have our month, and then we have a normalized stream flow. So divided by the sum of the monthly data, and we get the sum of that should be one. So that's going to run a little bit. I'm going to fast forward here. Okay, so it should be outputting a file soon to our example output folder. Okay, there we go. So now it's run successfully. So if I open this up, now I see I have a time series of discharge. So I'm going to plot this time series to show you a little bit. So we got quite a few questions about model spin-up, and this will illustrate some model spin-up. So remember, I did my simulations from 1980. And so we can see here in our model outputs that our year from 1980, which are over here, are really wrong. So we have that large spike and then some um, variations in 1980. Oh, and that's because the model uh, wasn't stabilized. And so now I'm going to start the stream flow from 1981 to illustrate. I'm just grabbing this data here. So I'm going to start. I'm going to plot the results from 1981 to illustrate um, how after one year the model stabilizes and we can actually get results. Oops, went a little too far. Okay. So I'm just plotting these results here. Okay, so now that's as expected. It looks much cleaner than a large spike. Okay, so that was a quick 20 minute introduction on how to set up the VIC model. Again, we had a lot of data pre-processed to enable this. Um, and by doing this, uh, by pre-processing and using those scripts, we can then effectively um, set up the model quickly and get results.
Okay, so now we have a VIC model that is run successfully uh, for the Mekong Basin. Um, and so here we're going to um, talk about some calibration processes. So calibration is a process of programmatically setting up and iterating over the model. And we do this to really find the best uh, parameters for uh, our basin. So that way we can accurately simulate the, um, uh, the basin's observations. Um, so typically we apply an optimization algorithm until our best parameters are found. And when we're calibrating, it's necessary to have an independent record of calibration and validation. So what I mean by calibration is you're using a data set to fit the model. And for validation, we're using an independent data set that we didn't touch to actually check if our calibration was successful or not. Uh, so we typically, so what I typically do is save uh, about half of the observations at a time series, um, or you know at least five years um, to use for calibration. And so what we're doing here is um, I'm going to show a cascading basin approach. And so what we're doing is we're calibrating for each individual sub-basin. So we hear, see here we have a sub-basin and the gauges. And so we're calibrating all of the parameters for each grid cell that contribute to that one uh, gauge. And then we're stepping through. We're saving this calibration for uh, the first ba uh, sub-basin. And we're stepping, stepping to the next sub-basin and calibrating those parameters and so on. And so you can see here, I, I put an example calibration plot. Um, so you see here that for the, the first basin um, in um, the Mekong, we can uh, more accurately predict the low flow period in the Mekong Basin. So this red line here is uncalibrated and the blue line is calibrated. And so when we're uncalibrating, we're actually having um, too much base flow in the dry season. And so by calibrating the model, we can um, account for that, for those errors. Okay, so next we're going to show a video um, that will quickly step through the calibration process. Um, and so this was a pre-set up case again. And uh, for, the, for the calibration process, it actually takes quite a while depending on the power of your computer. Uh, for example, for me to calibrate the entire Mekong Basin, it took me about a week to a week and a half uh, on my computer. And I just have a regular uh, desktop laptop. So just be aware that that is uh, a limitation, is time. Um, and so, and the reason why it takes so much time is because it keeps on setting up the model, running the model, checking the outputs, and then uh, finding those best parameters. Um, and so just understand that it takes a while if you're going to do it on your laptop. It would be a whole lot more efficient if you load it up on a server or a cluster and do the calibration process there. Okay, so here we're going to walk through a little bit of the calibration process. This is a little bit more in depth because uh, it takes quite a bit of programming and finagling of the data to get it um, to get it all set up. So the calibration process is really programmatically um, setting up the model so that way it can iteratively um, create these parameter files like we showed earlier and then chain and tweak those parameters within those parameter files and then get the results and compare that with uh, observed data and then um, retweak those parameters. So here uh, we have a script, which is our Calibrate VIC example. Uh, basically, the whole idea is we have our VIC model. We run the VIC model. So here we have paths into all the parameter files. Uh, we have our output flux files, um, our uh, variables for the routing file. And so here we're basically creating the soil parameter file iteratively and then running the VIC model. So you see here that VIC NL G and then passing in that global uh, parameter file and then routing the VIC model using this function here and then returning the data. So here I'm using a uh, package called SpotPy. Uh, it's a really good package for calibrations. If you guys are interested, I uh, highly suggest it. And so we specify our start 
an end date, and then which parameters to calibrate. So I'm calibrating my infiltration curve, my um, fraction of maximum uh, soil water where nonlinear base flow occurs, uh, my fraction of maximum base flow where nonlinear base flow occurs, and then my two uh, soil depths, my two lower soil depths. Okay. Uh, so this script just basically iteratively goes through, um, it estimates the parameters and then iteratively runs the model and then outputs results. Okay, so let's see this in action. So I'm going to use uh, my terminal again to run the programs. So I have my Python call. So I'm going to do OG Python, Kali, great, oops, example. Uh, for this particular instance, I have to specify my station name and the number of iterations. So I'm just going to put 10, for example. Theoretically, you want to put maybe 5,000 to 10,000 iterations for it to actually run uh, and get the best parameters. And that can take weeks to run, uh, depending on your machine. So I'm just going to hit 10, so that way we can get an example of running it. So Right now, our algorithm is starting with 10 repetitions. Um, and so it's going to set up the model and then rerun the model and then output some results. And then so the end results of this will actually be a CSV and it will give you a parameter set and a objective function like root mean square error or Nash Sutcliffe, uh, how, it, how that parameter set compared to the observation data set and then you use the um, you use the objective functions so you find which parameter set fit best and then you just pass those parameters or you create your soil parameter file with those parameters so here I wanted to highlight some example stream flow and flood monitoring outputs that we can get from Vic um, so this was using that pre setup case that I showed earlier um, so we have uh, routed VIC outputs um, to simulate discharge, and you can see here that we're getting a hydrograph on the right and then uh, runoff on the, uh, above the hydrograph. And you can see that there was like a big wave of runoff that was simulated uh, based on precipitation. And you can see this red line here, yellow line means warning, red line means flood, uh, that we're actually getting flood um, levels at that red dot the gauge at that red dot. And so this is highlighting uh, flooding in uh, 2007, where heavy rainfall in early August, and we'll see it coming up here soon, um, created flood level discharge. And so there's the runoff and then the flood peak. Okay, next we're gonna talk about some drought monitoring applications. Um, so Vic is used um, in quite a few drought monitoring um, um, frameworks and um, the flexible outputs of Vic. So we saw earlier that we can change which outputs we want to get out. Um, and so like soil moisture or um, evapotranspiration, all that can be used for drought monitoring. And so here we can see that there's like moderate or severe drought where red uh, colors mean that's more drought conditions. Uh, throughout the Mekong Basin, and this was during the dry season um, after El Nino event, which in the Mekong Basin creates drought or heavy drought conditions. Um, and so we can extract out a, a point in time and get a time series of droughts. And where typically we see here in the dry season that it's just picking up droughts, and that's because it's there's no precipitation during that time. Okay, lastly, I want to talk about some uh, VIC applications for basin management. And so what I mean by basin management is that we use a hydrologic model and some uh, additional uh, scenario information, and we use that to create scenarios, uh, like what-if scenarios for a basin uh, to understand if you implement this policy or change this kind of uh, area in the basin, what's going to happen. And so um, what we did here was we uh, simulated hydrologic changes 
for different changes of uh, land cover um, in the lower Mekong Basin. So this figure on the left here shows an increase in forest by 10%. So for the entire basin, um, areas or uh, the entire forest area will increase by 10%. And we can see the uh, changes um, uh, spatially throughout the basin. So here we're getting a lot of storage occurring in the lower parts of the basin. And we're also increasing evapotranspiration. And then on the right here is increases in agriculture area. And so here we can see that there's decreases in storage and decreases in evapotranspiration because there's less uh, leaf area. And so um, this kind of information can be used uh, just to understand what's going to happen um, with these with these small changes. And also we see changes in discharge too, where forest area is decreasing discharge, agriculture area is increasing discharge. Okay, so next I wanna hand it off to Amita. So she's gonna talk about some specific uh, VIC applications that are used uh, more widely. So I was talking about um, applications that you can use for your uh, for your setup where you can customize it and um, look at different outputs. And Amita is going to talk about some just general VIC applications that are used in the community. Okay. Thank you so much, Kel. Um, I think it was very informative uh, just to walk through all the steps that are required to uh, prepare for VIC in, uh, running and also how to run it and then finally how to calibrate it. So as you can see, um, it is a time-consuming process, but then any modeling is, and especially as important as hydrology is, um, it is justifiable that um, it requires a little bit of effort. So with that, um, we, we here are some examples of WIC applications. And before actually we start uh, talking about how WIC is used in the community, I want to show here um, some preliminary results of what we show, uh, what we did last week. We downloaded 2017 uh, input data, as you remember. We started in 2016, January 1st, because we needed one year of spin-up time. And finally, we ran the WIC model for starting in January 2016 all the way to September 2017, because we wanted to study July-August flooding event in um, Mekong Basin. So on top left, you can see here, this is the iMERGE rainfall time series. This is uh, basin average uh, rainfall. And what you can see here is that in, in, in July, end of July, this is 24th of July, there was a spike in, in uh, there was heavy rain, and then it continued. Uh, there, are, there were several uh, rain episodes, and this is, one month accumulated rain over the basin and you can see in this area there was a lot of rain during that month and with model we ran with meteorological forcing for this period and what we see here is the runoff produced by the model at this particular location 103 east and 17.4 uh, north and you can see that Following that rain spike, we captured uh, increase in runoff. Um, and this is the base flow map uh, and runoff map, just a snapshot for 26th of July. And if you looked at the time series or animation of this base flow and runoff, uh, you would see how flood evolved in this region. Um, and so this is preliminary results now we are calibrating this model, and then we will be doing some more analysis. But this is just to show you that um, what we got from the inputs we downloaded last week. So we're going to now switch to how WIC is used by the community. And one such application is for global flood monitoring. Here is a web tool based on WIC. It is Global Flood Monitoring System, or GFMS. And here's the website that you can uh, look at in detail. But this uses WIC model. Uh, and input is from near real-time TRIM, or Tropical Rainfall Measuring Mission Multi-Satellite Precipitation Analysis, which is called TMPA. Um, some of you already indicated earlier that you have used TRIM data. And even now, 
although trim is not there, uh, trim calibration is used to, uh, to adjust other satellites available currently, and then this near real-time analysis continues until this will be taken over by iMERGE, GPM iMERGE, very soon. All other meteorological forcings are obtained from MERA analysis, and there is a routing model used, which was uh, developed at University of Maryland. It's called Maryland Dominant River Tracing or Routing or DRTR model. Here are some of the references. And when you go to this website, you get near real-time flood detection or intensity. So all the rivers where there is uh, stream flow that exceeds flood level, that's been indicated. Some more analysis is available also, and here is a case of earlier this year, there was a uh, flood in Paraguay River uh, in January 25th, 26th. You can see uh, here it shows flood detection intensity above threshold. Uh, it was above by about 100 to 200 millimeter in this area. You can blow this up, zoom into this map, and see how exactly which area had a lot of overflowing uh, flood, and then you can pick any particular pixel and see how flood uh, intensity changed. You can also look at stream flow, how it uh, changed. So there's a lot of information based on WIC uh, in which Trim and Mera were used as inputs. So again, this is um, a overview of the same thing, uh, that it's a Paraguay River flood uh, forecast. So this now, um, MERA, we talked about Goddard Earth Observing System, or GEOS. This has been used uh, for forecasting. So MERA is uh, analysis, so it is near real time. So near real time flooding uses MERA as forcing, but for forecast, GEOS forecast is used, and it WIC gets forcings from this forecast. And based on that, um, about four to five day flood forecasting is done by GFMS. So again, this is a uh, very useful tool that is based on WIC, and it has been used for flood management in a variety of um, regions and areas. One more application is for water resources management at continental scale. And here is a system. Um, it's called Global Land Data Assimilation System the North American Land Data Assimilation System, and Famine Early Warning System Network uh, Land Data Assimilation System. So it's FuseNet um, LDAS, it's called. These uh, systems, they are gridded forcing from a variety of sources, such as MODIS, um, uh, NOAA uh, sensor, there's land cover, FAO soils that we talked about, uh, MERA2, again, is used. So a number of inputs are given to these systems, and WIC is coupled, so that's used in a land surface model, and that provides um, fluxes based on water and energy balance. And so this is widely used for water resources management because it provides consistently derived uh, water resource components, freshwater components, such as precipitation, evapotranspiration, runoff, soil moisture. So uh, as Kel showed earlier, uh, looking at like a basin scale, you can look at different, uh, some of these components and can decide uh, how to, how, where the water access is or where more availability or depletion of fresh water is. And one such example is, I'm showing, is this FuseNet. This is the FLDAS uh, site, and this is, you can go here, and there's a lot of information for different regions. Here's just one example for Southern Africa. And one parameter that I'm showing here is monthly soil moisture in 10 to 40 centimeter depth. Uh, and what you see from FLDAS is uh, the, this is the actually soil moisture. This is in September 2017. And here you can see that there was deficit. This is the anomaly or departure from long-term mean. So you can see that there was depletion of soil moisture. There was deficit. And that uh, this is the person change in soil moisture. And so this information is used to 
give warning about food security. So if you go to FuseNet site, you would see that how hydrologic information derived from models such as WIC can be used, uh, look at different water components, and then link it to food security in different regions. At this specifically, uh, FuseNet works in Africa. Um, then there is one more um, web tool. It's called Princeton Global Flood and Drought Monitor. Um, sometimes you may have data lag in this, in the sense it may not be near real time. But this is also based on TRIM uh, TMPA. And it deri derived stream flow. It's displayed. And you can you have on on left hand side if you go there you will you can pick temporal and special domain and zoom in and look at what kind of stream flow you observe. So this is also um, a tool that provides information using WIC and remote sensing data. Lastly, uh, this is a, a report that you can look at. For example, it's um, again for re uh, water resources management. And WIC has been used by U.S. Bureau of Reclamation to manage Colorado River Basin water supply. Uh, if you will go through the report, and you can see that this was this is in 2011. So WIC has been used. Uh, it was developed in 1994, got mature over the years, and it's been routinely used by uh, many uh, entities. And and U.S. Bureau of Reclamation used uh, earlier to to do. Uh, basin management in Colorado River. So this, these plots basically just show a validation of WIC. So what one can do is you run the WIC model for your own river basin and validate it, uh, calibrate it with certain um, in situ observations, such as if you have stream gauge, then you can uh, calibrate it. And then we can also validate it. And once you do that, you know the error bar over um, what WIC produces in your region. And then you can consistently interpret uh, WIC output for your own river basin. So again, it, it, is, it, it requires a little bit of work, but WIC is mature enough that it has been used by uh, many uh, entities. So these are some of the applications. And this brings us to the end of this webinar. We had three sessions, so I want to summarize what we just saw in last three weeks, including today. So WIC summary is that it's an open source, grid-based hydrologic model. Uh, we have talked about all the websites where you can download the model. The model code is written in C language, and it is tested on computer which are Unix and Linux uh, operating system. So on Windows or Mac, if you want to run this model, you have to have a virtual machine. So you have to install a virtual machine which, can, um, which is basically Linux based. And then you can run WIC model on your, on your desktop if you have. Um, it can be set up to run at grid resolution ranging from 3 kilometer to about 2 degree. That's where it is quite accurate. It requires daily input for water balance mode, as we talked about um, earlier. And if you want to use energy balance mode, then you have to have sub-daily or uh, like 3 hourly or 6 hourly, even hourly data uh, should be used. There is a routing scheme that is required. Um, to actually look at um, where you use WIC simulation, um, along with some additional information to actually route the uh, runoff and see where the stream flow is increasing. And um, very important to keep in mind is that it requires regional calibration and validation before you actually use it for any decision making. It's good to know how well it works in your river basin or watershed. We talked about inputs and outputs in, in great detail in last week's and today's uh, webinar. And what's important to know is that um, NASA provides remote sensing based input data. We, earlier we saw what, what is required. And then here is a list of parameters that we can actually get from remote sensing, uh, meteorological forcing, uh, you have vegetation cover, um, albedo, surface albedo initial soil moisture condition that can be derived from precipitation, climatology, 
soil characteristics data, elevation, these things you need as input, and many, most of them are available from remote sensing. And output, again, is all the freshwater components that you can analyze to, to, to either do your basin management, you can get idea of whether there is data, uh, I mean, water excess, there is flooding situation, or there is water deficit. Uh, not only you can see it evolution with time, but in different uh, special region within different parts of basin, how water balance is changing depending on how land cover is changing, as Kel showed earlier in example, whether it's agricultural land or it's forest land or it's urban area, how things are changing with changing land cover and meteorological forcing uh, that um, you can use for uh, management, water resources management. What is uh, important is that you require um, input data and you have to format it in specific way. So that's a time consuming process. So model downloading and installing, it's relatively easy. Model is already developed, but to create input in specific format, gathering it from different sources and feeding into the model, that's a time-consuming process. At the same time, analyzing output, then calibrating it and routing it, uh, um, that also is so pre-processing and post-processing, both are extremely important, although the most difficult part, which is model development and, and, and validation too, they are done. We still need a um, lot of effort and training and understanding of how inputs and outputs can be handled. So that's, that's the message we want to uh, give here. Here is the summary of all the input data sources that we used. Uh, where you don't have ground-based data, uh, remote sensing data can be really valuable where you, we, you can actually use them to run hydrologic model. If you have very sparse um, in situ data, you can use them for calibration and validation and use remote sensing data as inputs. So here is a summary of all the forcing data and other parameters that we used and sources and the websites where we got the data. They are summarized here for your information. So at later time, if you want to uh, grab the data for your own uh, river basin or any watershed, you can go ahead and do that. And then we also reviewed uh, how WIC is used for water resources applications, especially basin management and flood monitoring, flood and drought conditions. Okay, so this is the end of the, this brings us to the end of this webinar. And we want to thank you all for attending this series. I also want to thank Kel Market for giving this webinar. He has used WIC model for Mekong Basin. And as we saw, um, he has developed scripts and procedure to streamline how to put input and how to analyze output. So that's a great help, Kale, and we really want to thank you on behalf of our set team for giving us this information. Uh, also, I want to thank Brock Levins for organizing this webinar, and Elizabeth Hook, she has uh, edited all the presentations and also helps with our question answer session. So again, on behalf of uh, the RSET team, we thank you for being part of this webinar series. And if you have any questions, please, as usual, uh, type in the chat box, and we will uh, try to answer them um, now. Or if you have any at a later date, please uh, send us by email. Uh, again, the homework link is given on our website, and please submit the homework by 16th of March. Uh, you will be awarded a certificate of completion um, if you attended all three webinars live and you also submit the homework by 16th of March, then in a couple of months, you should receive a certificate by email. So thanks again. And uh, we can take your questions now. And Kel, if you want to add anything, please do. Hi, everyone. I just want to say uh, thank you for your time and attention. And thank you to the RSET team for allowing me to uh, come and you know present on this work and help make uh, make 
hydrologic modeling more open. And uh, yeah, I hope I hope everyone is able to follow up and use the Vic model. Um, if you do, I'd be happy to hear how you're using it. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to contact me. Thanks again. So question one, does the Vic model work on hourly time scales? Um, the answer is yes. So the Vic model uh, will be able to simulate um, any kind of step or time step less than one day. So the maximum or the minimum time step you have to have is daily data. Um, any kind of data after that, uh, the VIC model will be able to run as long as you specify what time step that is. Okay, so question two, how can we analyze for changes in terms of time series? So um, there's a lot of research that has been conducted looking at time series analyses. Um, it really depends on how you want to, or what kind of information you're trying to get from your analysis. If you're looking at, say, long-term changes, then maybe just looking at your percent change uh, from a climatology would suffice. Or if you want to look at trends, so you can use your time series to calculate uh, like the change per year or something, or change per time step. So it really depends on your analysis, but I would suggest um, you know taking, getting an idea of what you want to and then uh, searching literature for what other people have done. So also, if you just quickly want to view the time evolution, you can use the Panoply tool that um, Rock mentioned. And uh, you can, that's very easy to um, install on your computer for analysis. Okay, question three. Are Python scripts used in the pre-processing public or custom-made? Um, the answer is both. So um, I created these scripts as part of my graduate research uh, to make the modeling or the model setup a lot easier, uh, at least from my perspective. And so, um, so in that case, they're custom-made. But what I've done is I made these publicly available for everyone to use. So um, I did send a script into the chat or a, a link in the chat box to where you can download that. Uh, the link is also in the PowerPoint presentation. Um, so yeah, you can go on there, download the scripts. Uh, some of the scripts are uh, custom towards the model setup that uh, we had, uh, specifically the meteorological forcing um, creation. But um, you are able to, you know, if you have any trouble, please let me know. And um, I'd like to hear feedback so that, so that way I can make it uh, better and fix any issues that um, come up. Okay, question four here. What initial parameters are you guessing about? Um, there's actually quite a bit. So, the soil parameters that we initially guess about are the infiltration curve, the maximum or the fraction of maximum soil moisture where nonlinear base flow occurs. We also guess the fraction of maximum base flow where nonlinear uh, base flow occurs. And we also um, we also estimate or, uh, I guess, guess about um, some parameterizations for each land cover, uh, such as your stomatal resistance, which is important for evapotranspiration um, calculations, and also um, some other parameters that go into that, like minimum, um, minimum solar radiation before evapotranspiration occurs. So there's all these that kind of get guessed, but there are um, published research that have these parameterizations, and that's what we're taking. 
And so if you have um, specific local data for that information, then it'd be best to insert that into the model. Okay, so question five here. Um, does it take days to run the weather time series? So I'm assuming this is talking about the creation of the meteorological forcings. Um, in some cases, yes. So um, what the script is actually doing is it's looping through the entire um, model grid that you have set up, and then it loops through the entire time series. So if you have a very large basin and you're modeling a very long time series, then this script can take quite a while. And again, these, these models aren't meant to be um, very, so the, the, the setup on the models are, are somewhat time consuming. And so once you have the model set up, at least for the meteorological forcing side, then it becomes quite easy to adjust the parameters, but the meteorological forcings are somewhat of static information and um, at least if you're doing hind cast thing. In your real time sense and you want to just append new data to it, then the script actually runs qu pretty quickly. So what I meant and it takes days to run is for the Mekong Basin, it's a very large basin and uh, we were running it for a very long time period, 30 years, and so it just takes quite a while. It also depends on the resolution, special resolution to, you choose to run it. Okay, question six, could we get the video file for model input and pre-processing steps? So I believe, um, Amita, we'll, we'll share this recording of today's webinar, correct? Yes, and it will be should... on the RSET website, you can watch the recording. Okay, so yeah, you can watch a recording through the RSET website. Uh, um, it's actually quite large, so I would, I'm, you know, if you really need it, then I guess I could share it, but uh, it also doesn't have any, um, audio. yeah, it doesn't have any um, voice recording over it. So I would suggest going to the RSET website and looking at it. Okay, question seven, does Panoply software come with VIC or is it independent? Um, Panoply is an independent software. Uh, it was created at, or it was created with NASA uh, for viewing NetCDF and HDF5 data sets. And I think we pasted the script, um, or sorry, the link a little further up so that way um, you guys can access it. Yes, right there. Um, it's easy so it, to download and install. So. Yeah. Question eight, is it necessary to install additional Python libraries for running Vic model? Um, so for running the Vic model, the actual model, no. But for setting up the model, um, like what we showed in the uh, in today's session, then yes, it requires um, a couple packages such as GDAL, uh, NetCDF4, um, also requires a package called Shapely, and there's a couple other ones, but if you go to that website um, where, uh, with all the scripts and everything, there's uh, documentation and it will tell you which specific packages and software um, I used to set up the VIC model. Okay, question nine. 
where can we find scripts for Vic? Um, again, all these are free and open, so I posted them online for anyone to access. Um, and so all the scripts are available through that uh, link that um, we've typed in here. And um, so there's, a, there's quite a bit of information. So there's actually a, um, there, there are the scripts, there's um, documentation, and then there's also test data. And so um, what we did is we packaged this all up into a virtual machine. Um, and you can download that. There's a link on the GitHub page to download the virtual machine. And so you can go through an example case that, um, that's in uh, Eastern, Eastern Africa uh, to set up the model and, and explore it using, using the, um, the tutorial that's in that package. I think the next question is quite important, Kale, if you can address it about the snow parameter. Okay, yeah. Um, so is the snow parameter file necessary? My study region does not have any snow. How to uh, address this situation? So the snow parameter file is not necessary. And the reason for this is because if the VIC model, if you do not use the snow parameter file, the VIC model will assume a constant elevation across the entire grid cell. So what that means is you're just going to be uh, simulating um, the hydrologic fluxes at that one elevation across a grid cell. With the snow parameter file, what that allows you to do is actually simulate um, different elevation changes within the, the model. And so if, if you're, and also, um, so this takes into account temperature as well, which is important for the energy balance. And so if your model does, or, or if your region does not have any snow and doesn't have uh, very uh, much terrain, then you can not use the snow parameter file. Sorry, let me rephrase that. Then it is not necessary to use the snow parameter file. Okay, question 11. Where can I get the calibration scripts? Can you help me with calibration setup? So the calibration scripts, again, are on the GitHub page uh, under the scripts folder. So there's, um, a, there's two scripts there. One is calibrate vic, the other one is calibrate vic. So the calibrate vic uses a simple Monte Carlo simulation, so it randomly um, so it randomly selects parameters and then for however many iterations and gives you the best parameter set. The SCEUA uses a optimization algorithm where it, um, it first randomly picks parameter sets and then within that, and then it takes that initial guess and then fine tunes parameters. So the, the way the scripts are set up are actually using those workflows that I um, presented, where we're creating the snow, uh, soil parameter file, um, turning our flux data into NetCDF, and then running the routing model, and then it checks those results. So in this case, the calibration scripts are somewhat custom. Um, if you do have any questions on calibration, uh, let me know and I will try and help out as best as I can. But um, just know that the calibration setup is somewhat uh, customized for your own uh, application and where all your files are and everything. Also, I have a suggestion about um, contacting Kel or any of us about calibration. Is uh, Please do try and uh, run the script according to the instructions that you got today. And if you have any specific questions or if you're stuck at some specific point, it's good to just ask those questions. It would be very difficult for Kel to walk everyone through the calibration process. So uh, at least you can watch the recording 
go through the process and wherever you have either questions or if you are stuck at certain uh, point, then you can ask a specific question. That would be helpful to us also. Next question is about homework. Um, uh, in the homework, you're not actually running the model, so it should not take weeks. Uh, this is the, all the questions are based on the three webinars that you just watched. Um, the information that you received, based on that, there are some questions. These are all multiple choice questions. You do not need to download any data, or you do not need to run the model. So it shouldn't take more than a few hours, actually. Okay, question 13. I am calibrating the VIC model by energy balance. In my case, the peak flow is too large. I tried a lot of manual calibration, but peak does not match the observed flow. Any suggestions? Uh, yes. So peak flow is uh, really dominated by your surface runoff. And in the model, the surface runoff is most sensitive to that B infiltration If I remember correctly, so your higher B infiltration parameter, uh, a higher B infiltration parameter yields higher surface runoff. Again, I, um, I may I may be remembering this wrong, but I can I can go back and check and um, actually get the correct results. But it's that B infiltration parameter that you need to calibrate, and it's either you need to increase it or decrease it to adjust for uh, higher surface runoff. So Kale, would the elevation band setup uh, affect runoff? Yes and no. <laughs> so, um, well, I, I would say yes. I would say yes. Um, and the reason being um, is that your, depending on your region, if you're having um, a lot of terrain in the region, then you can have snow accumulation at the peaks of mountains. And with that, so um, by having accumulated snow, that's actually adjusting your timing of runoff. So if you think about it, soil or uh, snow is storage, and then it actually has to melt before it's considered runoff. And so if you're having, if you have a lot of terrain in your region, and then there's snow accumulation, and you're not actually capturing that snow accumulation, then that would probably give you um, more runoff than you are, you are expecting. So in addition, I just want to make sure that we convey this, and I'm trying to understand that if even if there is no snow, if you, rather than using mean terrain, if you use actual terrain, would that affect stream flow? That would, right? Maybe not the total runoff. So amount of water running off will not change, but stream flow will uh, change, depending on how you represent your terrain, even if there is no snow. Yes, that's correct. And um, so you do have... Flow, like peak flow. Uh, so it, it does matter, I think, elevation, how you represent. That, that will have some um, impact in addition to infiltration. Okay, so question 14. Can we find all the commands of the VIC model, including parameter creation and running? Uh, yes, there is a tutorial available uh, with, the, uh, with explanations on the commands uh, that I demoed. All on the all within the um, GitHub page that or that link that we shared. Okay, so question fifteen: Where do I get parameters required in vegetation library file for different vegetation classes and modus? Um, the answer to that is I would look at literature. So I, um, so 
what I did is I, I, I skimmed through a bunch of um, published research and created a parameter set for IGBP um, land cover classifications. And so that is also available on the GitHub page. And from what I found, so I've set up the model in a couple different regions and uh, for a couple different applications. And what I found is that parameterization set actually does a fairly good job. Um, so I would suggest doing or using that, or else you can uh, look at published research and use their parameterizations. Okay, question 16. Is it possible to run sub-daily model runs using the scripts that were shared? Uh, yes. So a lot of the scripts are set up. Um, so the parameter or the soil parameter, the vegetation parameters, the snow parameters, those are all static uh, or those are not dynamic in time. The meteorological forcing is the only one that would be dynamic in time for the parameter setup. Um, and so you would just have to customize that uh, formatting of the meteorological forcing script uh, to read in your data at um, sub-daily time steps and write the data at that sub-daily time steps. Okay, so question 17 was I have a VIC model, but the correlation between observed and predicted data is only 0 0.3 meters. How can we get good correlation between observed and predict data? Um, so I would, I'm looking at that 0 0.3 meters, and I would say that's somewhat pretty good depending on your area. So if we, in the Mekong Basin, if we get an error of 30, 30 centimeters, then I would call that really good. Um, but so I, I, I guess it really depends on your region. Um, and I would try uh, performing some calibration processes on that to make sure you're um, trying to capture or you're getting the best parameter set. Also, too, it depends on your input data set. So um, the model is pretty sensitive to errors and precipitation. So if you have um, precipitation data that has or does not capture peak uh, runoff or peak stream flow or those high intensity storms or does not get the right um, amount of precipitation that occurs, then that can cause errors within your results. Okay, question 18. Uh, so the vegetation and soil data used in the examples are available at global area. Uh, yes, they are. So um, in session two, we went through and um, talked about how we can or where to get these data, the soil data and the MODIS data, and uh, what all the data is. Um, so um, like the file types, uh, like what kind of classes they are, and then here was showing how we can um, use that data as inputs into the model. Question 19, can I calibrate the model on Windows SIGWIN by your giving calibration scripts? I don't know. That would be I would need to try that out because I wrote the scripts for uh, a Linux environment and not a SIGWIN environment. And so you would need to make sure that we have all the necessary packages involved or installed on SIGWIN before you can do the calibration process. So the question 21 says, do we have to use Penoply to um, produce the transform data, uh, process the transform data? Not necessarily. It's just easy. Uh, it 
feeds NetCDF, an HDF file, and that provides um, maps as well as um, navigation through the time plots, like multiple times. It can go through back and forth. You can make time series. So it, it's just um, convenient to use. Uh, but if you want to, if you have any other analysis or graphic package that works with NetCDF file, you can use that as well. Okay, question 22. My question is really to precipitation inputs. If I use a local graded precipitation product, do I have to resample this product to the same resolution as other inputs, or is that not necessary? Yes, you do have to uh, resample it to the inputs or the grid cells that you're running the model at. So the model um, assumes that your precipitation is the average aerial precipitation for that grid cell. And so what the model actually does on the back end is it takes that average aerial precipitation and it uses that um, the area of the grid cell and all that other information to calculate your volume of water later on. And so that's when you um, that's how we know how much water is actually coming into the to the region. So um, so if you do resample as long as you're having a an accurate mean for that area, then the model should capture all those uh, dynamics. Okay, question 23. Can the calibration based only on discharge ensure the realistic measure flow duration curve? Oh, sorry. Um, ensure the realistic individual hydrologic component simulation since it's important for hydrologic process characterization? That is a really good question. And um, so this, this is somewhat of research, and I, I believe that um, the calibration process on discharge only solves for water balance. So when you calibrate your model on discharge, you're only getting your components of surface runoff and base flow correct. And then it's assumed that the other balance components equal out to being correct. Whether or not it's actual um, actually modeling those processes correct, like snow, um, snow water equivalent or evapotranspiration, um, the model doesn't care about that as long as it's able to um, model the runoff and baseball correctly, if that makes sense. So there, there are ways to do what's called a multi-objective calibration process. And so that way you are calibrating your model on discharge, for example, or evapotranspiration or soil moisture. Um, so that way you are um, using multiple um, pieces of information to calibrate the model. Okay, do you have a multi-objective script, including, for example, signature measures, flow duration, curve, soft data, uh, surface runoff, base flow, uh, besides the uh, calibration of discharge uh, for model calibration? Um, right now, no, I do not. Um, so uh, I am working on a calibration process that's uh, taking into account uh, soil moisture, evapotranspiration, and uh, discharge. So that way we're capturing all those uh, components correctly, but that's still in the works. Um, if you're interested in that, follow up with me in about a month or two. Okay, question 25. What is the minimum area of a basin that should be applied for VIC? Um, I would say you have at least three good, or four grid cells. Um, so that way you are 
capturing the spatial um, components uh, in the basin, but you're also, um, yeah, uh, so that way you, you capture the spatial components, but um, you can also, sorry, I'm blanking on what I want to say here. And so what I think Paul is trying to say is that um, highest resolution you can run WIC is three kilometers. So you need at least four grid points, which are at least three kilometers. So I think the smallest watershed, I would say um, about nine to 12 square kilometer, that's the minimum. Would you say that? Yes. Thank you, Amita. So that's the minimum, uh, you, that, that's the, sh the smallest watershed that you can work with. With, with some accuracy and reasonable representation of all the processes. Okay, question 26. Uh, before calibration of the model, is sensitivity analysis necessary so we can limit the parameters to calibrate? Um, it's not necessary, but if you do a sensitivity analysis, then yes, that would definitely help with your calibration process. So that way you can um, simulate or calibrate on the parameters that are only going to really affect your results for that basin. And so um, there are methods to do sensitivity analysis. Um, I haven't done one myself, but um, I think it'd be really good if you do do one. So the next question is about has the a weak model applied in watershed in Arctic region. So University of Washington has developed a regional uh, model for Arctic using WIC and DOE is I think funding it. I'm, I'm giving Elizabeth will type the link here that you can look at and if you just search for WIC for Arctic you will be taken to a report or a presentation that uh, University of Washington has put together. Okay, question 28. Can we transform the output files into a different format to be read by other programs? Uh, yes. So I personally um, like using NetCDF datasets. Um, that doesn't mean you have to use them. So if you have a specific format that um, you like to use, then please use that. Um, and just make sure you you understand how that how those flux files are actually calculated and so the flux files again are um, the flux files are a time series at each grid cell and so if you want to use any other kind of data set like a GeoTIFF or a HDF5 or or something else just make sure you understand how the flux files are formatted so that way you can properly format your um, your other data set. Okay, so question 29. What interpolation methods do you suggest regridding all the data to a common grid? Um, so it really depends on the data set. Um, so what I use is for uh, discrete data like the soil classes or the uh, land cover classes, I use nearest neighbor uh, because it doesn't make sense to interpolate or get half of a class value or something. Um, or for elevation, since the VIC model needs mean elevation for the grid cell, then I just aggregate each grid cell to the mean value. Um, in the case of other data sets, like if you're trying to uh, spatially interpolate or snap elevation data, then you can use, or sorry, not elevation data, but um, yeah, so your, yeah, your high resolution elevation data, which is needed for the snow parameter file, then you, then I use bilinear interpolation, and that typically does the trick.
okay, is it possible to have the setup of a model for a specific basin in West Africa as the model has been used for flood and drought monitoring projects at Princeton in case it is possible to get it, who can I contact? Um, so yeah, you can set up the model for theoretically any basin, um, but I would, um, I think, Justin Sheffield is the PI for the tr flood and drought monitoring project for Africa. And um, I would suggest contacting him if you would like to um, learn more about the model setup that he has and um, if you can access that model. So question 31, how long is it necessary to perform automatic calibration using the um, SCEUA algorithm and regional uh, small watersheds with lakes and reservoirs to get optimal parameters? Uh, so the SCE, SCEUA uh, calibration uh, program uh, actually converges uh, fairly quickly compared to other calibration processes. Uh, and I would say it's about 5,000 to 10,000 iterations. Um, it really depends on how many parameters you are trying to calibrate and your region. Um, question 32, is VICAB available in, as R scripts? So, um, I want to distinguish here, so the VIC model itself is written in C uh, programming language. And so um, right now, I don't think there's any plans to make it into R scripts. Um, they do have Python bindings for the, for the model right now, but those are more in development. Um, so the actual VIC model, I don't see it being written in R, but for the setup process, um, that, so uh, what I demoed earlier using Python, then yes, um, we can make those available in R scripts, but that would take quite a while uh, translating between Python and R. A question 33, at what point would you consider your surface runoff calibration good enough for the Mekong Basin example? I've used root mean square error and other statistical methods comparing real to simulated data, but I'd be really interested to hear what is generally used for, uh, for your use in the VIC model. So what I use is um, I use a, a, a article as a standard guideline. Um, I will, I don't remember it. I know the citation is Moresi et al. 2007. Um, I don't remember the specific name of the article, but I can um, put that into the QA document later on when we share it for you so you can look that up. That is a really good um, article that basically creates a standard for evaluating models. And it gives you guidelines on what is what error statistics, such as your Nash Sutcliffe uh, model efficiency coefficient, uh, your R or your correlation or your root mean square error or bias. It gives guidelines on uh, which thresholds to use or, or that are that you can use to be considered a an acceptable, a good, or an excellent uh, model setup. And that's what that's the those are the guidelines that I follow. Thank you so much, uh, Kale, for all the answers, and thank you all for attending and taking interest in this uh, webinar and this topic. Um, and we look forward to your feedback. You will get a survey um, about this webinar, and that will be your chance to give us uh, your feedback. How we can. Um, improve our training and how we can provide 
more training in future. So please, uh, when you get the survey link, uh, we request that you do take time to fill out the survey about this webinar. Thank you again for attending this session, and uh, we look forward to see you in future. Please stay tuned and uh, connect to the RSET listserv so that you can uh, stay updated with all the trainings that RSET is uh, offering. And you can contact us via email so that if you have any specific questions. Thank you.